welcome to our series about the forest school principles. In today's video, we're going to have a conversation about why forest school is learner centred. I'm Lou, I'm one of the forest school associations directors and with me in conversation is Lily. Hello, I'm Lily, I'm chair of the FSA and a forest school trainer and practitioner. So the Forest School Association is the UK charity for Forest School that aims to promote and celebrate quality forest school for all. We were set up in 2012 as a grassroots organisation after the UK Forest School community wanted an umbrella organisation to unite under and to help represent them. The forest school itself is a type of outdoor learning that happens over a long period of time in an outdoor woodland environment and aims to build confidence, self-esteem and emotional resilience in the learners. There are six key principles of the forest school ethos that underpin the philosophy and the way of working. These principles were created in 2010 by the UK forest school community. Then a couple of years later, when the Forest School Association was created, part of its remit is to promote and celebrate these principles. In this series of videos, we're aiming to take each of the six principles and unpick it in a bit more depth through conversation. So we'll be looking at what does the principle mean, why it's important to Forest School, and then how do we put those principles into practice? I'd like to start by looking at the definition itself of this principle. So I'm going to just read it out. Forest School uses a range of learner centred processes to create a community for being, development and learning. So Lily, do you think you could unpick that a little bit for us and explain what that means to you? It's interesting stuff, isn't it? Because it talks about learner centred. I mean, that's that's the first bit in there. and that for me is around focusing on the needs and interests of the individuals who are part of a forest school program and when we look at it a little bit more we think about how that how learner centered might be different from learner directed or learner driven and how those kind of look in in reality as well um the bit i really like is this idea of creating a community of learning though because that that for me feels like the real core of what forest school is about is building that community of learning in a natural environment that that really speaks to me there so you talk about learner centered possibly being different from learner directed and some of the other terms so do you think you could speak more to the differences between those descriptors yeah i find it quite interesting that the principles talk about forest school being learner centered rather than learner directed learner led because it also talks about play and choice being a really key part of that approach really valuable to that learner centered for me is is thinking about what are the needs what are the interests what are the things that will help this person grow and develop learner directed might be just the, the things that they're interested in so there's no for me there's less a, a external input in, if something's completely learner-led, learner-directed, rather than being learner-centred. So when it's learner-centred, you're, you're guided by the needs and interests of that person, but that's not the only driver, you know, there's an external influence, more of an external influence, which I think is where the forest school practitioner has their role. And what about this formation of a community? Can you speak more to what that might look like? Yeah, so the, the, some interesting conversations recently about how forest school and the planning for forest school is around not just the individual, but also the group. So holding those two things together being really important. And so a lot of, of, of the process of forest school and, and forest school is being about in that process rather than it being a product. And the, part of that process is about creating a community of learners. And that takes time, you know, that takes relationship building. It takes the practitioners and the the other members of that learning community to reflect and observe what's going on for each other and to grow and all of those things that kind of uh, are around the sort of human development and the outcomes that come out of, of of that part of the process so you mentioned about forest school being different to curriculum led outdoor approaches so do you think you could speak a little bit more about that please 
Yeah, there's, there's something that um, I read recently about curriculum based approaches and I'll, I'll, I'll read it out because I liked I like the quote It's giving children the answers to questions that they have never asked. And for me, that's one of the things that really shines out about Forest School is that actually as a for the participants, but also for that community of learning that we were talking about, you're all in there trying to find out answers to questions that you didn't even know you had but that have come up and are really live in that moment and are really brought to you by the place that you're in and the people that you're with and so all of that how that then moves children towards the the outcomes the, the personal social emotional development outcomes that forest school is so great at delivering i think is really key mm. one of the things that i find quite interesting is the fact that as, as a in the UK certainly we're quite driven by the curriculum and so when people talk about how do they make sure there's space in the curriculum for forest school but they're not able to deliver that curriculum through forest school you know what what, what does forest school offer to that and um, this idea that if, if we've got attitudes and skills for learning which I think is one of the things that children really start to develop when they're out in the woods, you know, that self-motivation, the resilience, the self-awareness, all of those things really help their learning attributes so that when they are looking at curriculum based stuff, they're really supported in, in their own skills and, and, and uh, attitudes to learning. Mm. Mm. And so that child led ethos, helps those attitudes emerge in a holistic kind of way yeah and that is the key isn't it it's about that holistic approach so it's not just about um driving children towards the knowledge it's actually what you know what's going on for them and, and really taking time to get to know them and build those relationships with the individuals so that you can then help them understand themselves and that you as an adult understand what their needs are what their drivers are what goes on for them and i think one of the interesting things and again when we look at play as being part of that um, learner centered approach is that actually children don't play in order to develop those outcomes and insights that's not the thing that drives them like oh maybe if i play in the mud kitchen i will develop better knowledge of materials that's not that that's not how children's brains work you know it's actually the thing that that internal drive that is taking them into their interests is is, is helping them sustain those inter interests over time as well. Mm. Something about play that I've noticed uh, when you're talking with other adults, teachers, parents even, is sometimes play can be considered a bit of a dirty word, you know, or they're just playing, you know, do your work first and then and then just play. So I wonder if you could speak a little bit about, you know, the essentialness and the value of, of play as a as an entity and particularly play in nature because we're talking about forest school yeah i mean play is play is just so key to human development in fact even you know in books that i've read about play it's not just human development animals as well develop their skills through play and it's it's there's a, a, a really nice sort of way of looking at it that um, Bob Hughes who's a, a play theorist he talks about that it play puts children back in the biological driving seat of their own development so that the things that they're interested in the things that they need to develop next will come out through their play but also play is how children process things it's how they learn um, so that this idea of just playing is 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 quite I don't know it's to to devalue the experience of the children and their kind of you know to not recognize what it is that they want and need in that moment you know whereas their body their brain is driving them towards something why is it why is it that a child wants to go and poke at the same hole over and over and over because they haven't finished learning about that thing yet so they keep going back to that that same idea or that same object or that same texture to really explore that or things that link to it as well so you know again it's it's trying to work out what that the world through their own experience and that that is so fundamental to how children learn and, and how they develop and how they grow and it's really easy as adults to kind of have this idea that you know well they're just playing that's because in part of our mind thinks what they're doing is a bit boring like oh we could be doing something that's so much more stimulating and there's so much more learning in it and actually in that moment it's because 
we've learned the thing that that child is doing. That's why it's boring to us because we don't have that same need, that same drive to learn that thing. Because if you look at a baby trying to reach their toes, we know where our toes are. We've really sorted that as adults. You know, we, we, most people have sorted out where are their toes, but for a baby, they're still deep in that learning process. So it's, yeah, it's quite easy for us as adults to think that children are just playing because we've moved beyond that stage of development. I've, I've read a lot of information about the children nowadays are getting less free play time and opportunities compared to previous generations and there's suggestions that that's having an impact on their both their mental and physical health I wondered if you had anything to say around around that and you know what happens if we don't allow children to play and particularly play outside yeah, there's, there's a really interesting map. I'm sure you've seen it. A lot of people have. And it shows the play range of dif different children, uh, uh, children in different generations going back. And it's based in Sheffield, which is where I grew up. So I quite like it as well for that. And so it shows the range of the, the great grandfather and he can travel um, three, four miles, something like that, across the city to go fishing. And then it shows the play range of the grandfather who um, you know travels a mile away to go to the swimming pool and then the mother who goes to the shops down the street and then the child who is uh, their play range is a thousand feet or whatever it is or a hundred feet you know pretty much the end of their garden and they're always watched and uh, what I think is really interesting about this mapping of, of children's play ranges is what experiences and interactions will they get in their free play as part of that range so for the for the lad who was, you know, in the, well, the grand, great grandfather who was cycling down to the fishing pond, who would he have met on the way? What would he have seen? What would he have experienced? That really rich range of, of stimulus for learning that, that, uh, and, and growth and all of that stuff that will, will have come in for him as, as an individual compared with a child who's only not allowed out of their garden. So we have the impact now because of the way our society is and there's loads of different factors that why why society is like that now and we can't change a lot of those factors but we can recognize that the effect the impact on children is is that of play deprivation and interestingly it's not necessarily those children that have, have experienced deprivation in other ways who always experience play deprivation you know there's a lot of um, evidence to show that children who are overscheduled with in terms of having French on a Monday and horse riding on a Tuesday and violin on Wednesday and all of this sort of thing actually have very little time for free play so that their experience is one of play deprivation although they don't have deprivation in other parts of their life and the impact of play deprivation actually is that you don't get to choose and control what's going on in your life and if you can choose and control what's going on in your life, that actually is one of the things that has an impact on your self-esteem and your ability to cope with what life throws at you. Because you've learnt how to control yourself, you've learnt how to make choices. So you get that impact of, of positive self-esteem. And then that positive self-esteem gives you, you know, those, those positive experiences of the world, which actually means you're better able to make choices and control things. So it's, it's this sort of virtuous circle that children get from from being in control of their own experience the flip side of that is that you then have children who are developing that um sort of uh, neuroticism or you know those sort of things where children feel anxious and stressed and not able to control things and not able to make good decisions so you kind of have the the flip side of that as well which you know is, is one of the things that i think this is quite concerning for a lot of professionals now is that we have consistently poor mental health compared to lots of other nations as well and in the UK in particular that's something that you know we're really looking at and and I think and a lot you know a lot of research shows that that, that poor mental health is an impact of, of, of lack of free play. Absolutely I, I mean I often consider forest school as being sort of a, an in-between because we live now in a culture where parents feel like they can't let their children go off and free play for a school's like an intermediate really an intermediate <laughs> whatever that word is for a school is an in-between that means 
that there are adults present, but there's still that play and choice there for the children. And I consider it a bit of a sign of the times that something like forest school is so necessary, you know, where, whereas before previous generations would just have that in childhood, they wouldn't need forest school because their childhood would be forest school. Yeah. So when free range childhood was just childhood, you know, that, 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 that's the distinction, isn't it? And that actually what we're seeing is the impact of a skill gap almost in children's play. So when, you know, thinking about um, my parents describing their play experiences and even comparing them to my own ex experiences, that multi-aged play stuff that goes on. So when I, when I was a child, all the kids from our street used to all just knock about together, you know, and so there'd be, I'd be maybe six and my brother would be nearly 11 and then there'd be some slightly older kids. And so we'd, we'd all learn from each other and they would learn to, to have empathy for and look after the little ones. And then as I got to be the bigger one, I would be the one, you know, setting the challenges and all those sort of things. And that multi-age play that was such a key part of a free range um, childhood, uh, can, transfers those skills you know like like the ideas that pass around are transferred in that way whereas now when we've got children who don't have those experiences there's a skill gap in play and i've started to see the adults who are the generation who are the, who've experienced that as well so you know the ones who are now 18 19 20 and maybe haven't had those play experiences but are the next generation of professionals looking after children and so that transfer of knowledge isn't happening because the adults haven't had those play experiences as well. So yeah, it's really interesting, isn't it? How, how forest school is, I think a lot of that need for forest school comes from that bit of society that we're missing. So I'm aware we've been talking a lot about play, but we haven't yet really unpicked what we mean by the word play. So would you like to unpick that a little bit more for us? Oh, yeah. Yeah, it is, it's a really juicy thing to try and unpick what play is. Um, the, uh, the play theorist Stuart Brown, he says play is, uh, trying to define play is like analysing a joke. You know, it's, it's kind of, as soon as you've picked it apart, you lose this sense of it. It's, it's, it's something we all know and feel. But actually, when you try and define it, it becomes really interesting. And so often when I'm talking with groups of people about what play is, we talk about, you know, what is play? And you can chuck in so many different words. It's social, it's creative, it's exploring. It's, you know, it, there's lots of things that play is. But when we flip that around, so play doesn't have to be. So play doesn't have to be social. Play doesn't have to be about exploring. Play doesn't have to be creative. You know, it, so whatever play is, is huge and broad, but it doesn't have to be that to be play. So the things that we end up left with are about this learner centered, the, the sort of the thing that where children have choice and control, they're the things that, that actually it's much harder to, to get rid of when you're looking at what play is. And again, that idea that, that play is the thing that the, that puts the, the child back in the driving seat of their experience is, is really key in that. Children know what play is. You don't, you don't need to make children play because they know it's it's intrinsic to them it's it's that stuff that, that leaks out of them at every opportunity um there's a, a quote that i was just looking at here that play is like oxygen it's all around us we don't notice it or appreciate it until it's missing and again that, that's Stuart brown sort of trying to define play is that really key core thing to our experience and so when we're looking at play in forest school for us as forest school practitioners we should be thinking about how do we then make space and time that children can process all of the stuff that's going on for them um uh, we, when we were talking about play before we were looking at how play benefits the children so there's, there's there's the fact that that's how they learn to be a human in the world it's how they process their experience so that might be role playing helps them understand the sociological stuff that's going on in in, in their lives or it might be that um, play helps them process a trauma or a, a difficult experience that they have. So there's certainly a lot of work being done with um, refugee children and looking at their play and their experiences, how those, those experiences come out through their play. Whatever goes into a child has to come out. And if it's going to come out, it's going to come out through their play. 
And so we've been talking a lot specifically about children, you know, knowing what play is and the benefits to children from play. But what about adults? Yeah, what about adults? <laughs> yeah, and that it is really interesting because, you know, one of the things I love is, is being with forest school practitioners because we get to play. But there's a, the flip side of that actually is, you know, these really playful adults are then let out in the world and their play needs sometimes overtake the needs of the children you know because they're different right as adults we have different play needs so it is worth bearing in mind that all humans have play needs and how we express those can support the children you know we could be modeling and then stepping away or it can actually just end up like steamrolling the children's experience and it becomes all about our play needs rather than theirs and that's something i'm always really mindful of with my own because i got a lot of play needs right and they're always coming out all over the place but actually what's mine and what's the children's is is one of those really key reflective um reflective questions that I ask myself like whose play need was that you know that's a, a good a good reflective question so in this final section I was hoping we could unpick a little bit about the application of the principle and how practitioners might go about applying the child-centered approach so to start us off, I'm aware we live in a very modern, indoor, possibly sedentary lifestyle now. And so many children and young people might not spend a lot of time outdoors or in nature. So maybe the majority of their play comes from spending time indoors or perhaps through technology. So what advice or tips would you give about trying to encourage that sort of learner to engage with nature for their play? that that you describe is 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 i think where the forest school practitioner and their own experience of play has real value because you know we were talking about that skill gap between children's experiences and in how they play and that for some children being out in the woods is really so far out of their experience it's actually quite scary and that's that's why forest schools are a long-term process as well because it takes time to build that confidence about being in the environment it, it takes time to build a relationship with the natural environment and it takes time to notice what those affordances are i mean i'm thinking about a group of of children that i worked with who are two and three years old living in a very urban place and going through the streets to their uh, nursery that was a concrete yard and so when they came out to the woods with me well for the first thing the bus driver said oh watch out for the crocodiles kids and they had no way of telling if there were going to be crocodiles in this woods or not because of their experience so I actually had to spend the most of the first session um, making sure that they weren't afraid of being eaten by a crocodile and we luckily found a big mossy log and climbed all over it and got to know it and all that sort of thing and so it takes time for the children to build that relationship with the natural environment so that they can actually experience the affordances of that and then that relationship as that relationship grows that that's where you get care and stewardship and love of natural environments comes from playing in and, and being a part of that uh, being part of that natural world so for us as practitioners looking at ways that children can start to build that relationship is 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 really interesting you know what are the what are the open-ended springboards that we can offer children so that they can find their own thing find their own needs and interests but they've got a solid enough starting point so for example um one of the things that i often do on the first session I've, when i'm taking a new group out is i've got some cards that have got descriptors on them can we find these things so just even looking and touching things and picking them up and seeing what things are like is is one of those things that so that, that group of two and three year olds i was talking about i never didn't realize that the leaves were not attached to the ground that you could pick up the leaves it took them a little while to realize that sticks and leaves are detachable so if you don't know that about the the natural environment how are you going to play if you don't know what there it ha what there is there so so start to touch and feel and manipulate and then some sort of little hook that might get you started so um one of the ones i've been using recently as a hook in earlier sessions is creating a birthday party for an ancient creature so something like that so if you want to make 
food out of mud yeah great that's brilliant if you want to make decorations that's grand if you want to invent a game it also you know so it's open-ended enough that people can find their own um way to navigate through it but it's it's solid enough a starting point that it gets people going and i think that finding those springboards for me is it, having a few of those up my sleeve can be really helpful to help children get into that natural environment start building that relationship and it sounds like through the case studies you were just explaining there that a lot of it is about saying yes and going with where the children want to take things oh yeah absolutely there's something really key isn't it about permission about children feeling like they've got permission and also about setting up the boundaries as well i mean that's something you know if we're, if we're looking at forest school the long-term process of forest school having those boundaries is useful but having the permissions is also really key um if you don't know that you're allowed to touch a stick how do you how do you expect anybody to then play freely and um and fulfill all that potential something i've noticed when working with groups and it tends to be particularly as you go up the age groups is sometimes they don't believe you when you say that they got a choice they they kind of almost think that you've got some hidden agenda about what you want them to do and a particular outcome that you want them to create by the end of the session so i wonder do you have any tips um, if people are working with children or young people who aren't used to being within that framework where they have got choice yeah, it's an interesting question. And I'm also thinking about some groups I've been working with recently where choice is a bit overwhelming, actually. So if you go, you can do anything at all. That is, is that same experience of overwhelm. That I don't know if you've ever had it when you've walked into a supermarket and there's like 32 types of custard and you just stood there going, I just want custard. You know, it's a, that same experience for, for, for children if, if they're just told you can do anything you want. It's, it's too much. Um, and especially for children who've got emotional or behavioural challenges, you know, challenges that they're experiencing so that they, they can't, aren't used to being in control as well. Practical things that can help those, uh, help children who, who aren't used to making choices is about having, um, having resources that offer certain choices. So I've brought the ropes today if anybody wants to use those. So it's, it's almost like you're not defining what they're going to do with them but but giving them that that solid starting point and um making sure that the resources that have been key to a child in a previous session so again part of that long-term process is about observing reflecting okay that really worked for them previously i'm going to make sure that's available in the next session or something that might allow them the same sort of play behaviors um, as well so that you're trying to consciously uh, offer things that, that might give them a starting point as well. We live in a world now where people aren't let to be bored, both children and adults, because, you know, as soon as they've got two minutes, they'll pick up their phone and they'll be scrolling through Facebook or anything. You know, it's very rare that people have a moment where they don't have anything to do. Sometimes as practitioners, we also have to allow people to find their own way into things. So we can sometimes take it as judgment on ourselves if if people aren't immersed in something but actually being bored is is a really it's it well so some of the play theorists particularly Sturrock and else they talk about the metalude so the thing that that you've got in your head before you start to play and that if we don't give children space or time to to like see what is there around them what what stimulus is there what are other people doing that sort of pre-play mental state if we if we're in there straight away here's 10 things you can do we don't allow people to make their own decisions we don't allow people to to work things out for themselves and actually if children are building their own brains as they play yet we step in and fulfill that need before it's even been expressed we're not allowing children to build their own brains we're just building ours and who's doing the learning? And that's something that I keep, another of my reflective questions that I come back to, to for myself is who's doing the learning in that moment? Who, who's, who's kind of growth is, is, is being fed with whatever I'm suggesting. And, and if it's mine, then I need to back off, like, you know, get out of there. 
Another thing I often hear sometimes from practitioners is they might be in schools or workplaces where there are certain expectations over their forest school sessions that perhaps are coming from managers who don't really fully understand the forest school ethos. So for example, trying to get certain curriculum outcomes or to try and force certain topics to take place within forest school sessions. So I wondered, do you have any tips or advice for practitioners who might be working within that sort of situation? Yeah, it can be really hard when the people around you don't share your values. And so if you're somebody who does value play and the children's experience, but you're trying to speak to people who the, the thing that's driving them is the, the standards or the, the results and things like that, that, that gap in values can be quite uncomfortable. One technique that I personally use quite a lot, if the person's alongside me when the children are there, is, is sports casting or describing what I'm seeing. Um, an example of that, uh, recently was a teacher that I was with year three teacher and we were watching a group of children and they all had slightly pointed sticks they were way like quite a long way away and they were running and screaming with these slightly pointed sticks and then they'd stop and he went oh I better go and step in because somebody's going to get hurt over there and so I started to sports cast I started to describe so it's quite interesting because they're all running as a group to that tree there and then stopping and then they look at something really closely and then they scream and then they run away again. So I wonder what's happening there. And, and have you noticed how this child, and so I really started to just describe everything that I was seeing. It does two jobs. It sort of calms and soothes me because it makes me feel like I'm doing something rather than like, oh, everything's out of control. <laughs> I, should, I should be in control of the fact that there's people running and screaming with pointed sticks. Um, but also we started to really closely observe what was happening. And then he started to talk about the experience of those children. He said, yeah, it's interesting that it's this group of people because they're all the ones in the classroom who don't have that self-control and self-regulation. And we, as we talked about this and, and kept describing what the children were doing, we realized that there was quite a lot of self-regulation going on. Like they were really in control of this quite high energy situation. So we, between us, we start to really pull apart what outcomes these, this group, particular group of children were getting from that experience, which would be very different to how the children were experiencing that moment. You know, we were kind of calmly analyzing all of the outcomes while they were just having an amazing time and running and screaming and kind of re but really working through a lot of that social play that children need in order to be able to be social beings social humans in the world um, something else that I find quite useful as well is reframing children's behavior as play cues so if somebody does something that's a cue that's an invitation for play so if it's directed at me they're inviting me to play so if a child comes and throws a stick at me, I don't take that as them trying to be aggressive towards me. It's like they, 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 that's a cue that they want me to play in some way. They want to involve me in their play. And again, using that sort of language when I'm talking to others, talking to, to teachers, to, um, to senior leadership team about children's skill in play. Because actually throwing a stick at somebody is a very unskillful play cue compared with hey do you want to play a game with a stick i've got a stick here verbally is a, is a much more skillful play cue so actually then taking that example as not being about somebody's behavior but actually about their skill in playing so can we give them more time more space to do that because that's actually going to support their social development and their physical development and all of those whole range of holistic outcomes that you talked about earlier so sort of helping people see the benefit of play can help people make space for it and make time for it as well. Is once a forest school's been running for a length of time, um, you can start to see different developmental changes and perhaps behavioural or attitudinal changes in the learners. And that usually speaks volumes to the powers that be in the school because they're starting to see that the learner centred approach is actually having positive effects for the individuals. That that's absolutely it, isn't it? That's why as a forest school practitioner we should be positioning ourselves as an advocate for children's play and an advocate for the children and their experiences and so that might mean having those tricky conversations with with peers with colleagues with senior managers 
And one of the things that I found really helpful is, well, so it's well known that policies are just power paper. There's a sort of paper you can just hold up and people, go away. I've got a policy. So <laughs> it's all right. It's all okay. It's covered. Um, so I, you know, I, I always make sure that I've got a play policy in place, but also that people who I'm working alongside have seen that play policy and that expectation around what the children will be allowed to do is really clear from the start of the programme so that, that, that people are expecting the children will be allowed to have freedom and, and autonomy as well. Earlier in our conversation, you did mention that perhaps we now have a generation of younger adults who are professionals working with children that might not have had play experiences themselves in childhood. And I wondered if, if there was a person who that was their background and they were coming to Forest School and trying to get to grips with play, having not had it themselves in their childhood. Any thoughts or tips around how to deal with that? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. I was, I was writing some stuff on risk recently so as part of that, I asked quite a lot of forest school practitioners if they would allow a child to take a risk that they wouldn't or hadn't experienced for themselves. And that, that is one of those really provoking things, isn't it? Because actually how we build our experience and knowledge of, of things that are a bit risky is by doing them. You know, we, we have to kind of get in there and, and try them. So if a child's doing something that we've never experienced for ourselves, that can feel really uncomfortable. It can feel really challenging for us. And how do we deal with that is a really good question so some people in this group of practitioners that i was i was talking to said that they they paused the activity while they talked to the child about it and that actually talking to the child helped them realize how competent and in control that child was and that helped them gr build the confidence to go actually yeah, they're, they're they're fine you know we were talking about tree climbing in particular in this case you know so this child's climbing in a tree and this this practitioner who hadn't experienced tree climbing as a child or as an adult felt really out of their own comfort zone but by talking with the child and and, and watching the child observing the child and reflecting on it realized that that child was fully in control that you know the the risk level was really low actually for them um so I think it is worth bearing in mind. Uh, uh, one of the other things I, I, I talk to practitioners a, a lot is about play fighting. So particularly fighting with sticks. Don't know if you've ever did it as a child. I did it a lot. Um, still do actually with my adult brother. If we're walking out somewhere, the two of us will get a stick and I'll start having a fight. And, and again, if you haven't experienced play in that way, it can seem quite aggressive or it can seem quite dangerous. And certainly when I first started out working in natural environments I remember like most of our staff meetings being around like what we were going to do about the stick energy because everybody was always fighting with sticks and you know it was not the, the productive idea that we had in our minds for, for the stuff that we do so we tried to stop it because we didn't know any better at the time you know and that was one of my first roles in this sort of work and and what I realized is that I didn't have a chance of stopping that sort of play, but actually by being with the children, really observing them, talking to them about their play processes, they taught me a lot about stick fighting. I am so much better at stick fighting now than I used to be because of that interaction with the children and also developing our language around it as well. So, so making sure that we've got consent with one another before we start stick fighting and all those sort of things that just really help smooth the path of, of, good skillful interactions with one another so another misconception i've heard mentioned about forest school is that you just rock up to the woods and you let the kids do whatever they want they're just out there playing and the adults just sit there drinking tea so um, what what would you say to that <laughs> wouldn't it be lovely if life was as easy as that and actually sometimes in a long-term program it can really feel like that as a practitioner but the building blocks that you've put in place the things that the things that a trained practitioner the skills that they will have developed and then passed along to the children allow it to seem like that sometimes but actually we we're thinking about the scaffolding that we can offer for those children as well so choosing our interventions so that 
sometimes we're taking on the role of the least adult and that children can just play and, and follow their own ideas but actually that we're, we're ready to support and to scaffold and to extend that as well so there might be times when the children invite us into their play or make requests of us as well so one of the things that um with the, with the groups I work with is, is, is making sure we're discussing what they need and how we can resource that. So that's one of my roles is, is sort of play resource um, person in that as well. But then also about introducing new skills and techniques in order to, uh, that, that children can extend their, their range of things that they can play with. So one of the things that Forest School is perhaps quite well known for in the UK is around introducing tools and fire to children and those sort of more challenging um, risky elements and you know I wouldn't just rock up with a bag full of knives and go yeah just crack on play with those six-year-olds seven-year-olds so some of that does need support and uh, structure in order that people can develop those new skills so that then they can play once they've got those skills, they've got those building blocks in place. So sometimes as an adult, we need to put in those safety structures in order that we can enable a wider range of play experiences. Sort of an analogy I sometimes use of the forest school leader is one of a graceful swan that on the surface looks like they're, you know, serene and not much is happening, but underneath the water, the legs are going ch -ch -ch because there's lots of quite subtle energies of the observation and the scaffolding all going on. Yeah, some, sometimes the forest school leader is like an upside down swan as well, isn't it? <laughs> like it's all just a bit flappy. And then <laughs> but actually when you look around, everybody's really immersed and like gracefully swimming along and the forest school leaders just having a little flap because they've lost everything. Like, you know, it's, it's both ways up, that swan. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I know one of, the, one of the things I find the hardest as a practitioner in, to do with play and scaffolding is knowing when is an appropriate time to sort of step in and offer a little bit of structure or a particular skill that I think might move a learner on and when actually to stay away and step back and let the learners discover it for themselves. Any, any thoughts or tips on that element? Oh yeah, it's, it's super hard actually that, uh, because actually, the the process of sitting back and observing is is really hard especially if somebody's struggling with somebody i'm, I'm thinking about a nearly four-year-old who was probably stuck up a tree but because of the place that i was working i was quite determined not to intervene in that and then you know like it's sort of been quite a long time and i'm still got this nearly four-year-old stuck up a tree at what and they weren't distressed and they weren't upset and they weren't asking for help so i carried on and then suddenly I looked around and they were gone you know they'd sorted it out but that was even somebody who's quite comfortable with with risk levels myself it went beyond my own comfort zone right you know it was like should I should I be helping I don't know so it's quite hard sometimes to watch somebody struggle with something but actually even though that nearly four-year-old was maybe stuck in that tree their their behaviors weren't distressed or erratic so one of the things I'm often looking for when I'm scanning loads of different people doing different things is the, is the sort of energy that's being put out. So if you see somebody who's like a, a sprinter, they're moving really fast, but their movements are in, in a very flowing way and they're not erratic and distressed. They're, they're very kind of, you know, flowing. And it's in the same way that actually people who are really immersed in stuff will have those same that same level of control somehow over what's going on whereas somebody who's really struggling so I'm just thinking about children using tools like if they're not you know they're like got the knife and they're starting to hack like that I'm straight there because that's that's not a flowing movement anymore they need some support they need some intervention because they're stuck they're struggling the same way that social interactions you know the ones that you start to move towards are the ones where it suddenly becomes a bit more you know choppy and kind of I always think of it like a like a meerkat you know it starts to swivel like that rather than something that's moving with a more flowing graceful um, air to it so yeah that's that can help you when you're scanning a group look for those those children who might need a bit more support so i've heard another misconception out there about play just being for very young children um i wondered what you would say about play in adolescence 
Yeah, that's a really interesting question because, and actually even teenagers themselves wouldn't describe what they do as play. You know, that, that actually if you say, oh, would you like to go and play? That sort of language isn't going to work for them. However, they still want those challenges and stimulus that, that is playful. Um, I'm just thinking about a, a group of uh, older teenage lads that I was working with a couple of years ago. And if I'd have said, let's play a game or let's, let's play this, they would have just, yeah, I, the withering looks would have been strong. However, I used to just chuck out little challenges, things like, oh, I bet nobody could nick that bag while I'm cooking the the pancakes here and then then we'd be in a in the depth of a really amazing game where we'd be playing and they'd be trying to sneak up on me and be like ah spotted you get back to the boundary and then they'd, they'd have their own games as well like there was this whole tracking um a fox that turned into a, a gruffalo that they were tracking through the woods at one point and they were really shrieking and and so delighting in that playful energy but if I'd have said to them let's play a game of tracking an imaginary fox through the woods. You know, again, it's about how you introduce things to things in a way that, that is congruent for them, that fits with them, that doesn't feel patronising or babyish, because that's the thing that they're trying to move away from. That's, that's not, you know, developmentally, that's not where they're at. But actually their need to play was super strong, you know, like really as, as strong as any earliest child I've worked with. And actually that, that kind of, I can know, thinking about how how this principle really fits with with them all together is for me it, it, as a forest school practitioner if, about being learner centered is about being an advocate for those children for those individuals in that group really observing what it is that they need what it is that they're interested in and advocating for whatever that is and you know sometimes moving out of our comfort zones in order to advocate for the things that the children want and need I've often wondered whether the need for play gets stronger in times of stress as I've observed for example year sixes in primary school when the sats are coming suddenly they seem to really crave um, play uh, in, in, in perhaps what might be considered more basic terms of play very physical sensory play as a more as opposed to elaborate games and things and I've noticed that in particularly when they seem to be stressed. I don't know if you've noticed anything like that. Well, and I was just thinking about that, what we were talking about earlier about reframing children's behaviours as play cues so that children who are really stressed will start to chuck stuff maybe and we'll see that as them lashing out. But actually, is it, is it an unmet play need that they're expressing? Again, like how skillfully that's expressed is, is a different question, isn't it? But yeah we all have those play needs we all um if you you only need to watch a group of children in a in a on a bus or in a queue when they're not allowed to play where they're meant to be just you know waiting in stasis and they'll be finding ways to play they'll be finding little games that they're doing little kind of things that they're exploring ideas that they're testing there's a um i can't remember the name of the the person but they said that play is scientific experiments conducted by children so all of those behaviours, like them testing the world, it's how children make sense of the world. And actually the things that they play with builds their experience. So if children play in natural environments, that becomes their experience of the world. If, people, if children only play on computers, that becomes their experience of the world. If children only play in concrete, that becomes their experience of the world. You know, so it, it, it's how, we, how children build their brains, their knowledge, their, their whole selves, their social selves as well. As a final question, I wondered whether you had a first-hand example of the power of play and learner-centeredness at Forest School. The, um, I was just thinking about that, that group of older lads that I was telling you about. And actually, one of them made a choice, and this isn't as much about play, but about his choices. Um, he, he was experiencing quite a lot of stress at home. There was a lot, uh, his family were homeless at the time and sort of moving between different relatives. And he chose in the forest school session to make himself this little nest, this little bed. And he cutched down in this little nest in this little bed and actually spent 
most of a session this is one of the very early sessions that he came out to the woods with us in this little nest and you know i kind of would go and sort of say oh just to let you know this is what's happening over here at the moment that's what's the, and you okay here and he's like staying here you know and, he, and then at one point he said oh i'm not very well and then he said he was fine but he just wanted to stay in this nest and afterwards we were reflecting on it you know like oh you know was that was that stress coming out of that what's going on for this child and what was quite interesting was then hearing him the next week describe to his friend who hadn't been there that week everything that he'd seen from his nest during that day you know so so actually his choice was, was something that was very static very you know when we, when we think about play we often think about very active stuff but his choice had been to just be in this one place and experience the woods from this one perspective but he'd taken in so much and, and developed a real relationship with that little bit of the woods, you know, and he was saying, oh, and at one point a bird landed on that tree there, you know, so he'd really experienced a lot. And I think that is a good reminder that, that people don't have to be active or excited or having fun to be really deeply experiencing things and, and making those choices. So we need to wrap up this conversation now. So a big thank you, Lily, for talking very honestly about your ideas for play. I feel inspired now to go out and find a stick and somebody to fight with. So, <laughs> <laughs> do you know, I love that um, that's going to be the outcome of this, uh, this webinar. That everybody's just going to go, do you know, I am going to uh, like take a stick and challenge my nearest and dearest. But yeah, no, thank you for the questions because it's been really interesting to reflect on the power of learner-centred approach in forest school. Mm -hmm. The reason why I was interested in talking about learner-centred uh, aspect of forest school is because my background's in play and play work. I used to be a play development worker for a number of housing associations and um, uh, charities that worked with marginalised children and families. I also worked for the Wildlife Trust for a number of years developing their play programmes and then was a, managed a number of adventure playgrounds and self-build adventure playgrounds in Bradford. So. Coming from all of that to forest school, I brought a lot of that experience and knowledge with me and I've been a forest school trainer uh, for the last 10 years and chair of the Forest School Association for the last two years. Thank you all for, for watching. We hope it's been a useful conversation for you and maybe unpicked certain things. We will put some references and signposting in the description bar below on the topics that we've been talking about. Do remember that this is just one of the six principles, so do look out for the other videos that are covering the other five. And um, if you've enjoyed this conversation, do consider visiting our website at forestschoolassociation.org and if you're not already a member, do, do feel like you can join us and support Forest School in the UK and you'll also have access to lots of other resources as well. Big thank you everybody. Bye!